Today we got something special for you on level one. I'm joined by Tech Deals. Hello. And we're going to talk about technology and deals, but probably not in that order. And probably actually a lot of stuff about technology. We've learned that Intel getting out of the CPU business. And so we're going to discuss that. Oh, that's clickbait. No, that's not actually true, but uh, it sure seems like that, doesn't it? After the earnings call, like why are, why are tech nerds talking about earnings calls? Like, no, talk about clock speeds and cash. Not earnings calls. So this is going to be really exciting. Next thing you know, Intel will be buying AMD. <sighs> <laughs> I think they might have already tried that once. Uh, <laughs> or at least they tried to poach Lisa Sue. That's... Uh, and, and, of course, we could also be gossipy and talk about the fact that uh, there's new people leaving Intel soon, but that's unofficial. It's uh, it's also... I think Jim Keller is already out, isn't he? He's on leave. He, he left uh, the... The, the stated reason, I believe, was that he was, I guess, to spend time with his family. Um, but apparently, uh, he did not want to work with TSMC, and the other guy did. And it was a power battle, and so he walked away because he didn't he didn't want to outsource chips to TSMC. Oh, that's going to... I mean, I get his point, because TSMC, yeah, they'll be more than happy to sell you a product, but any money that you give TSMC is going to go into TSMC's bottom line and their R&D and improving their products and blah, blah, blah. And that's money also that you don't have as a company that's also in the same business to do those things. And so it's like, well, guys, we should just throw in the towel if we're going to you know, outsource to other foundries. Well, that and you're improving your competitor's product because that money then... You know, if NVIDIA wants to outsource to them or AMD wants to, then all of a sudden their product just got better. I mean, the, what has Intel really done over the past 42 years but be ahead in process technology? Yeah. Now, Intel has an amazing war chest of patents. I don't know if a deal could have been brokered, but like if they wanted to not, not try to do like the, you know, scorpion frog deal, I'm not sure who's the scorpion and who's the frog in this arrangement, but if they wanted to try to avoid that, they could have cross-licensed their patents to each other. And then we might have had a really insane fab powerhouse. Because, I mean, let's face it, uh, things are not going to get much smaller on silicon. We're going to have to go to other materials. We're going to need, like, carbon nanotube transistors or something crazy. Metamaterials that haven't been invented yet. Single cobalt atom transistors. Uh, stuff that hasn't been dreamed up. And it's going to take a while to spin up those kind of fabs and materials and things like that. Because... Silicon's just too darn slow. Well, that and I wonder how much innovation has been stifled over the past 20 or 30 years in terms of making a better CPU rather than a smarter CPU because the process shrinks have been, I don't want to say easy because I'm sure very smart people have done some very smart things over the years, but say from the 80s to the 90s, to the early 2000s, every 18 months to 24 months, the die shrinks were sort of, it was almost like they just laid out a schedule for 30 years and delivered for 30 years. And so with easy die shrinks, easy clock speed increases, relatively speaking, they didn't really have to make a monstrously better CPU. I mean, to be sure, a 46 is better than a 386, a Pentium is better than a 46, but some of the gains we've gotten have come from process shrinks, and some have also come, I think a lot of people forget, we didn't used to need monster tower coolers and liquid coolers for our CPUs. I had a little heat sink on my 46. <laughs> yeah, CPUs like used to be 5 watts, and that was normal yeah. for an desktop. Yeah. So some of it is the yeah. ramping up of power consumption. So the question is, think AMD. Oh, actually, I have a good uh, example here. I actually have sitting here a FX... Uh, 95, what is this, 9590, the first that, 5 gigahertz 8-core CPU. And then also sitting here, because I have props for our live stream, a Ryzen 9 3900X. <laughs> okay, technically, the FX chip is a higher clock speed, and it's 8 cores, and it's many years old now. So what makes the Ryzen 9 so much better? Is it that it's higher clock? No. It is a smaller process, to be sure. It's 7 nanometer versus 32 nanometer. But is it also because it's a better designed chip? In other words, they they optimize the architecture rather than just shrinking the architecture. Yeah, it you know you don't have to look very far to look at uh, 
confirmation of that theory. And strangely enough, it's in ARM. And I don't really want to, you know, it's like, I don't want to give Apple too much credit here. But if you look at the stuff that Apple has done with uh, power management, which is one of the main things, like Steve Jobs and I, I don't know if it was, I would, I really hope uh, Brian Krasnich or whoever it was at Intel, the executive that was at Intel, if this is a true story, but, you know, rumor has it that Steve Jobs and the executive at Intel, they basically had a knockdown drag out fight because Steve Jobs was like, no, I need a low power, no heat. I, you know, I'm going to build what would later become the MacBook Air. And he's like, this is a new form factor for notebooks. People want this. This is what the market wants. You're wrong. You know, typical Steve Jobs, like super abrasive, this is what we're going to do. Rumor has it there were prototypes that were using the AMD CPU because that was sort of at the end. You know, one of the, you talk about advances from Intel, one of the best advances from Intel was prompted by AMD having the Athlon X2, which outperformed what Intel had at the time. And so the sort of the sleeping giant woke up and there was a renaissance and then we got Nihilum and, uh, well, we get uh, Core and just, you know, all, there was all this wonderful stuff that sort of came out of the, wait, they're doing what now? Are you telling me Pentium 4 was not awesome? <laughs> Netburst is, uh, you know, I hate to netburst your bubble there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it was so bad. We had to go back to the Pentium 3, turn that into the core solo. We just dumped a bunch more cash on it. Some people in Israel spent a bunch of time on that. And it was like, hey, this is not a turd. And then, you know, <laughs> thus was born the core architecture. And uh, Intel had spent, you know, talking about clock speed. Intel had spent so much marketing dollars that, at least in the U.S., the, the Core Solo and the Core Duo, they didn't really market that here in the U.S. until way later as notebook CPUs. But they were actually desktop CPUs in Japan. I imported a motherboard. Uh, it was a socket something like Micro PGA. Really? And, and, a, and a Core Duo processor from Japan. And it was like 1.9 gigahertz. And I was like, this thing is probably terrible, but it seems like it's really good from reading these Japanese language forums. And holy crap, it destroyed the Pentium 4. But Intel had done so much hardcore marketing to be like, look, our Pentium 4, you know, net burst is like almost 4 gigahertz. And this, you know, Athlon X2 5000 plus is not really 5 gigahertz. They're lying to you with those numbers. And then it's like, oh, yeah, it turns out our, our core, core Duo and Core Solo are like 2 gigahertz. And they're faster than things that are running at 3 gigahertz actual. So it's just like, uh yeah, I've I've seen uh, Core Duo, not Core Two. For 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 anybody listening who may miss this, it wasn't a big product for a long time. But the Core Two Duo and the Core Two Quad that I think most people who have been around for a little while at least remember from the desktop, and that's what you know brought Intel back from the penny of four mess. Um, but there was actually a Core Duo and a Core yep. Solo that didn't have the number two in it, yeah. and there were some MacBooks that had a Core Duo, not a Core 2, but a Core Duo. Uh, weren't the Core Duo's 32-bit chips, though? They weren't 64, were they? Yeah, because in Intel was still trying to force everybody onto the Itanic, which was bad. You know, Iatanium <laughs> is a terrible name because it turns into Iatanic way too easily. <laughs> Never name a product that can be modified to Titanic that easily. Well, again, it's, you know, it's another data point on sort of the hubris there because, you know, I don't, I'm sure that it's not one person that is intentionally grabbing the wheel and steering the car into the, uh, you know, into the median, but it's definitely another data point in like, this is what we want. And it turns out that Steve Jobs, you know, I don't, I, I hate admitting this, but Steve Jobs was exactly right. If Intel had sort of gotten on board with the oh crap we need a super insanely low power x86 they could have been in phones they, they could have been everywhere but instead apple really did a lot of tooling with arm and there's a lot of insane stuff like apple engineers sat down with the you know with like ipads and phones and stuff and they said okay most of the time the screen is off what do we need to do and so instead of having this you know, giant elaborate machinery that was on inside the CPU. They did crazy stuff like Big Dot Little, where you have, you know, completely anemic but very power efficient cores inside the inside the silicon. And when the system's in standby, it's running all these background tasks and doing stuff. And Intel, you know, trying to sort of do something similar, they added some you know bolt-on technologies to X86, but X86 has never achieved, you know, iPad level 
uh, power uh, or performance or or any kind of like performance with an asterisk there, uh, but power and performance efficiency and some of the other stuff that Apple has been able to do. And really it's just by bringing the software super close to the hardware. Now that's also limiting. There's, there's an Achilles heel aspect of that because it stops being really super general purpose. And the example of that is like video editing on iPad. And so like video editing on iPad is a dream glorious experience compared to video editing in say like Adobe Premiere on a, on a laptop. But your experience in terms of like what you can do is a lot more limited on the iPad. So it's a little give and take. Do you not think that one of Intel's problems, uh, we, we talked about this a couple of days ago, a couple of days ago from when we're talking, not from when people watch this, about about the whole Intel thing and about the about the the fact that they're putting contingency plans into place in case seven nanometer slips any further. Uh, I, I looked up the history and I talked about it a little bit to the audience because I think a, a lot of people today, if they haven't done any research, they weren't around back when this stuff was all invented. And the original Intel, skipping the first few CPUs, the original Intel 8086 was originally released in 1978. And it was a 16-bit processor in the 70s with 29,000 transistors. And it's where the whole x86 things x86 thing comes from. We are using a platform an instruction set, now granted it's vastly improved, super scalar, out of order execution, 64-bit extensions. I mean, it has been extended to the moon. But the fact that we're using a design that is a derivative of a 1978 design, look at ARM, look at what they're able to yeah. do with how many fewer transistors, how much lower clock speed, and how much more responsiveness by being risk and by not having to be backwards compatible with a 1978 processor. Yet if Intel leaves that, look what happened with, I, as you said, with Itanium. The minute you leave x86, what do you need Intel for? Yeah. Yeah, it, in a lot of ways, I think that uh, there are analysts, that, like the Wall Street analysts are sort of muddying the waters a little bit, but I think some of them get it. And some of the, some of the technical, technical analysts get it. But you really hit the nail on the head because Intel's best hope for an x86 future is literally AMD. Because <laughs> if it's not AMD, then it's ARM. And then it's over for both companies. So think about that. Like, think about how insane that is. Because, you know, I've reviewed the, uh, the Marvell X2, which is a phenomenal platform. If you're running Linux and you just, like, for, like, the web server, like, the prototypical web server, I'm going to throw a production load at this. Uh, I did some experiments with that. Nothing that I can I can I can put on video, but just to see like how good it is, it is darn good. And for, uh, we've got for the for the benefit of my viewers, can you tell people what that platform is? It's a it's a, it's a Cavium Thunder X2 is a a uh, alternative CPU. It's a it's a it's a it's a platform exactly like what we're talking about, which is not x86. It is you know. Uh, a, an advanced platform that has had a lot of engineering is mostly PCI Express compatible. You can add your PCI Express peripherals. It's up to the, the device vendor to provide platform specific binaries to be able to do something with it if it needs firmware. With something like Linux, you're basically fine, you know, aside from the, the binary blobs and some of the other stuff. But the instruction set is compatible enough that for applications like running a web server, I'm going to run, you know, we're going to run my PHP 7.4 and WordPress and memory cache and memory bandwidth and I/O and all this other crap. It's fine. It's more than fine, um, and that means that the cost is vanishingly small because you've taken something that is industry specific, like x86, and you've made it a lot more generic, and you've also lowered the cost by opening up the playing field to another competitor. And so, like, if you have somebody like you know, Marvell saying, hey, we can deploy these for Amazon. And you get Amazon, they're like, oh, we're interested in, in this. And so Amazon sort of goes their own way in the same kind of direction with Graviton. So like you can get Amazon instances that are, that are ARM based. And yeah, the performance is not there, nowhere near there. And I think Apple is not gonna have the single thread performance of either Intel or AMD out of the box. And I think they're gonna struggle with Thunderbolt compatibility. And I think they're gonna struggle, they're gonna stumble in a lot of ways because of their hubris but I think that it's mostly going to be fine, kind of like iPads are mostly fine. And in a lot of ways, 
is a much better first class software experience for people that just want a computer computer like device to just do its thing and get out of the way like i get why it's appealing to people i, I cannot agree with it philosophically but i get it i get why it's people will, will, will buy do you, that do you think apple's making a mistake going to arm i think that apple going to arm i think i think a better move for apple would be to go to a hybrid approach i think if they'd approached amd and said we want you to do chiplets but we want an x86 chiplet and an arm chiplet i think that makes a lot more sense as a transitionary product um, and that's kind of what Intel had planned with Itanium. They're going to have x86 coprocessors and then do the thing. But I think, strictly speaking, moving to ARM, because the iPad and the iPhone are so strong and the App Store is so strong, that's what's going to carry the product. And I think that Apple is like, with their, you know, Darth Vader-like <laughs> grip on the uh, app ecosystem with Xcode, because that is actually legit not a terrible developer experience if you don't color outside the lines on the <laughs> Apple platform, that it really is not a lot of work for you to, to generate an ARM binary for the App Store. But for people that have a lot of software engineering and software development in their software, it's going to be a huge pain in the butt. And uh, and I feel sorry for those people, and it's going to be terrible. People with Thunderbolt peripherals are like, well, my Thunderbolt peripheral work on the new Mac? I can just tell you right now, probably not. Because, yeah. Is Apple going to do what they did when they went to... Well, I guess going from, from PowerPC to Intel was different. I, I guess I'm more thinking, I remember back in the 90s, I used to be into Power Macs quite a bit. I actually had a Power Mac business at the time. And, but this was back in the um, G3 days and even the pre-G3 days. Once I got to the G4, I started to get out of it. But uh, when, well, I remember when the, Apple... the G3s had PCI Express, like old, or not PCI Express, PCI, like the old school 33 megahertz PCI. Yes. Uh, I still actually have a G3 and a G4 here in my office. Um, that's uh, back when Apple used to build desktops that you could upgrade and change yourself. <laughs> well, no, it's funny that you bring that up in the context of the whole Thunderbolt thing because you remember, I think it was PageMaker or Quark Express, they had the PCI accelerator card. Something they had. There, I believe were, you. It's been a long time. <laughs> there were companies that had PCI accelerator cards, and it was like, oh, the Intel Mac's coming. So I could take my PCI card and put it on the uh, the, the Intel Mac, right? Because it's just PCI. They never made Intel Macs worth. You could you can't do anything to them. <laughs> Which is your point, obviously. Yeah, duh. yeah. <laughs> but it's 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 frustrating because what um, I I was never a, an Apple authorized service center, but I had a business back in the '90s of refurbishing and reselling uh, used Macs. We we would clear schools out and and some businesses, but frankly, it was a lot of schools by the pallet load. And a lot of these machines either had the drives taken out because under contract they would shred all the drives, or or they were missing parts because people took things out of them before they got to us. But what we do is we get, but we got them for so cheap it was disgusting. And we had more labor into them than we had anything else. But what we do is we'd take like a like a, a Power Mac 7600 or a, a, the beige desktop G3, the one that had the very cool um, uh, thing that just opened to the side and oh, yeah. everything was in there, toolless, and it even had the built-in arm that just held the lid up for you so you didn't have to like stick some piece of metal on the floor. <laughs> you know, they always did a good job with that kind of stuff. And we'd put more RAM and more storage in, install, you know, OS 9 on them. This was the days before you had activation and product keys. If you had an <laughs> OS 9 disk, it would install. And I loved them because they were easy to work on and they worked or they didn't. You know, sometimes the motherboards are bad, but I, I want Windows to have competition. I mean, I know you love Linux, and of course, occasionally I get my my own viewers who say, why don't you do more Linux coverage? Linux is amazing. Linux is amazing for the technically inclined. I, we might disagree on this, and that's okay. I think that Linux is too fractured. My personal opinion, if the year, the year of the Linux desktop is never coming. And the reason why it's never coming, at least the way I first used Linux back in the 90s. I've dabbled in it briefly here and there. And every time it's which flavor are you using? Which distro are you using? Which GUI are you using? You know, what drivers do you compile? What do you have as a binary? It's too fractured of an environment for the average consumer to mess with. 
and it's been tried several times. Uh, when Red Hat got serious and you started actually finding Linux uh, CDs in CompUSA's, I thought, oh, we might be getting there. This might be the, th this was 20 years ago. We might be getting there. But if Vista didn't do it, if Windows Millennium Edition didn't do it, and if Windows 8 didn't do it, it ain't gonna happen. However, yeah. we might actually get Linux in the sense that, how much time and money has Microsoft spent with the Linux Foundation? I would not be surprised if five years from now, we're all running Linux that looks like Windows. I, the Windows subsystem for Linux, which is just Linux under Windows, uh, it's surprisingly good, and it's probably going to scratch the developer itch that Microsoft Microsoft should have done a better job up till now with developer tools. And you're, you're probably not wrong about the Linux fragmentation stuff. There's a lot of stuff under the hood beyond the kernel that really bugs me. But it's, it's crazy because the Linux kernel itself and the work and the stuff that goes into it, I mean, it is... It is like a Roman aqueduct, or like a you know, like the longest Roman aqueduct. It is like the Great Pyramids at Giza. It is just an incredible feat of human engineering, because it's not like having worked on very large, like commercial stuff under the hood is, that is as complex and ha and has just scary, staggering amounts of development dollars invested into it. The, the source code in Linux is sort of beautiful. It is it, because it's open and because it's public. It's not perfect. It has it definitely has its warts, but mostly it's beautiful. It's beautiful code. It's clean. It is the most incredible standards compliant. Like you know, the, the most fringe, like super obsessive people that will look at it and be like, "No, we must improve the code formatting. No, we must you know do this. We must change that." And you don't get that in like the commercial thing. Is like, "Oh, it, it ships. It compiles." 50% of the time, ship it. And in Linux, it's like you have Linus Torvalds, and he's like, oh, this is the most brain-dead thing. What's wrong with you, you terrible human being? I, you know, and then so he, he sort of toned that down in this new age that we find ourselves in. But we don't it, have it, somebody I, like that. It, it's yeah. like the difference between somebody who's just paid to put up a, a building versus um, an artist crafting a masterpiece. Yes. It's people who care about their work. I, I'm right there with you. From a technical point of view, from a from a uh, ability to control your destiny and who owns the computer, you, not Microsoft or Apple, I mean, I'm right there with you in terms of technical superiority, uh, uh, cleanliness of code, uh, better options. If I could snap my fingers and get the world to be technically inclined, I'm all on board the Linux train. The problem is that there are still too many programs that don't have a Linux version. It's making sure that they run on whatever you're running. And of course, if 20% if, if, if of the market tomorrow went on to Linux, eventually one would win. And you may not want that to happen because think about this for a minute. If 20% if of the entire PC marketplace went to Linux tomorrow magically, and 19% was on one distribution of Linux, how much attention, how much developer work would ever be done to the others? You'd end up where we're at now, where you download the drivers for your video card, but they'd only ever work on that one. They, they would stop even trying to make them work on anything else, because why would you? Why do so many companies make software for Windows and not for Linux? Market share. Windows is 95% of the market, so everybody makes software for Windows. If 95% of the Linux market was one version... I think that it's a little... The problem... I don't think that really directly attacks the, the problem of fragmentation. Okay. The kernel, the kernel is the kernel, and the kernel is beautiful largely because of Linus Torvalds and the tone that he sets. It's open source. It's like, hey, you want to take your own version and go over here and do that, and that's completely fine. You totally can. But we don't have, uh, you know, it's like the, the wizard in uh, Fantasia, where it's like he can direct all the things, and then sort of Mickey gets loose, and, you know, and then things go horribly wrong. Um, 
the rest of the distribution is where sort of things go horribly wrong. And the kernel itself, I mean, you had all the GNU utilities, but, you know, some of the infighting and the architecture and the things like that, I mean, you had all the GNU utilities, because everybody could agree on how grep should be made. But, uh, I mean, that's not really, that's the joke. But um, but uh, they didn't have a kernel. And so Linus Torvalds comes along and is like, let's do a kernel. And uh, that charisma, uh, the charisma and the leadership and all of the other componentry there is what sort of led that as a subproject. And so you expand that to a distro, and we don't have that, either commercially or just, you know, the Pied Piper of leading the developers, the idealistic developers, the people who want, you know, the craftsmanship of the code leading the distro. We had, you know, maybe a little bit, but the problem is that as you play that role, Linux changes you. You become technically sophisticated, even if you don't want to. So even if we had somebody like Steve Jobs who wanted to be, like, the most horrible person ever, but, you know, actually build the desktop by the time they're done they're like you know what i'm gonna learn how to use emacs and we're just gonna call it a day and it's it's completely fine which is not really the best thing for the unwashed masses we might have somebody like google who is like this is our vision for the desktop and we're gonna build that and you have that a little bit in in chrome os because chrome os can run linux applications really well we might be having a different conversation if from day one it was a priority for google to be able to run Linux applications, but I think they saw that as a security problem potentially, and that was what they, they really wanted a locked down device, which is sort of antithetical to the whole open source thing. Well, look at so, the difference between Android and iOS. You either have control or you have security. How do you have control and how do you have an open platform? Well, I mean, you, you, can, you can have, you, you can have both, and so I think that sort of how do you Brings secure the computer against the idiot behind the keyboard? <laughs> a lot of virtualization, a lot of virtual machines, a lot of checkpoints, um, and so the really the, the the parable for this same situation it played out in the '80s, and it played out when Microsoft was was nascent, and it was with Lotus One Two Three. Microsoft had Excel, and they had poured all all of their profits and all of their engineering time because DOS had done really well into Excel. And Excel was a genuinely good product. It was good engineering. It was solid. It worked really well. Uh, Lotus really had not put a lot of money into 123. 123 hadn't changed a lot. 123 needed a lot more features. Windows had taken over, and so Microsoft was in the de facto position to have a better version of a 123-like product in the Windows environment. Meanwhile, Lotus was struggling because they were DOS wizards, so like DOS wizard programmers making the transition to Windows. A little sketchy. And Microsoft could not get Excel to take over the market, even though it was like, look, we'll just, we'll just give it to you. If you already have Lotus, we'll just give you Excel. The magic was when they added the ability for Excel to save as Lotus 123, which the suits for the first three versions, four versions of Excel, the suits had said, no, we, we've got to hang on to our tiny, tiny market share. We can't let anybody, you know, so there's people out there that are using Excel. They're going to go back to Lotus 123 if we let them save as Lotus 123. We cannot, we cannot have that because from day one they had import from 123, but they didn't have save. And as soon as they added save from 123, almost overnight, Lotus was gone. And it was because people could adopt Excel, but if they knew, if anybody said, hey, can you save that document in a 123 format, they could save as 123, not a problem. So the friction for everybody adopting Excel overnight was not, you know, importing from 123. It was being confident that they could export to 123. So I think the way that Linux takes over overnight has more to do with uh, being able to run Windows programs either in a container through virtualization or having robust technologies like Proton uh, where people can be confident that their existing Windows applications will just work. Certainly we have the technology. It's encumbered in licenses more than it is technology, um, which is why I think there hasn't been a lot of development there. But machines are powerful enough now that you can just run Windows in a VM and be able to run any legacy applications that you need. But what's still missing is that cohesive desktop experience that has the insanely, like people that are obsessed with getting the system desktop latency down the just as minimum as it's like oh we've got an extra one frame an extra 16 milliseconds delay because we have to you know have an extra frame for the compositor on linux or chrome can't have video acceleration or firefox can't have video acceleration unless these conditions are met and it's like no like no we cannot have that 
we need this thing so fast that your machine feels like grease lightning and responds immediately. And if we can, if we can conquer those hurdles, we'll have Linux on the desktop. But yes, we do have a ways to go. Well, there's licensing, but there's also look at the troubles that hap that's happened with games recently with de novo and some of the anti-piracy and anti-hack tools um getting some games and programs and launchers you've got to get buy-in from so many companies to get origins launcher to get epic games launcher to get uh you plays launcher to run on a virtual machine on Linux, much less, you know, through Wine or through Native, but even getting to run in a VM and getting the the various, I mean, shoot, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've followed much of the game DRM stuff lately, but there's been some hubbub about some of the recent versions of DeNovo, which essentially install rootkits on your Windows machine where they yeah. load at startup and getting rid of them. I mean, they've started to back off a bit because of the fervor and the complaints. But how are you supposed to run this stuff in virtual machines and in a protected environment when they want root access to your computer at, lo at boot, whether you're running the game or not? <laughs> I think that some of those problems go away when you've got a more educated gaming base. I think most people would actually care about those kinds of things because more often than not, those technologies also bring a lot of instability. It's just a hidden reason for instability. I mean, if we look at like the Sony root kit, that was like, oh, we're going to cripple your ability to burn CDs. It's like that introduced just layers upon layers of, of instability. And, you know, Microsoft has kind of spoke out against some of that, some of the kernel level stuff that's like super low level. They're like, no, we're not going to permit this. This is going to break a lot of stuff because uh, I think in the current insider ring, some of that DRM is actually broken right now because uh, Windows has the read only kernel data structures protection thing now and so some of the drm is is already like you can't game on that windows insider ring because of those kinds of reasons for certain games um i, I think you should be able to get a refund for a game that doesn't run when windows is protected <laughs> yeah i think that yeah. should be a legal right i think it is i mean look i don't mean to get all preachy here but <laughs> i i think that when software developers think they own your computer yeah that makes the hair on the back of my neck start to shake it, it is a problem that goes away a bit when you have a, sophist a more sophisticated audience. So the DRM thing is not really new. I mean, I've been doing the whole Windows as a virtual machine for almost 10 years. And most of the time, uh, until very recently, I would say the last two or three years, when it started to get popular, game companies didn't care. And then it was like, oh, wait, people are cheating. And they're like, well, maybe we can just you know figure out how people are running a virtual machine and just sort of disable that. Or using a virtual machine for cheats, which is a different thing. Because, like, I've got Escape from Tarkov here. I was helping troubleshoot some performance issues with it. And I'm not running it in a virtual machine. I'm actually running it on bare metal to troubleshoot an issue. But it's like, oh, you've got developer tools installed. You've got, you've got Hyper-V or VirtualBox. It's like, I, you can't run the game because those, like, there's not even a virtual machine running in the background. It's just like, you have that installed. We can't permit that. And it's That's a really Sony all thing. over again. Yeah, it's a really ham-fisted way to deal with that. Valve has leaned on companies to not do that. So there have been a couple of cases where games that were working under Proton stopped working under Proton. And then, from what I understand, Valve has applied some pressure in those situations. But it's still not, a, it's not, a, it's not as ideal a situation as it should be. But I think long-term, uh, it's just not going to matter. I think that long-term, you're going to have to be able to run these things in some kind of a container. There's just no other way to manage security. I mean, even Microsoft sees that. They're, they let you run Windows applications inside the Windows Sandbox. And the Windows Sandbox, I, I did a video on that a while back, but the Windows Sandbox is awesome. It, it's not awesome in that Microsoft did some really dumb things, like if you turn it on, you can't turn on other virtualization stuff. But uh, you can right-click run Windows Sandbox, immediately have a secure Windows Sandbox, open the mysterious attachment, and as soon as you close that Windows Sandbox, everything in there is destroyed. So if you just, it's like, let me open this PDF. You open the PDF, it's like, oh, that was a virus. You just close that. It's done. You, you close it. It no longer exists, which is awesome. Do you think NVIDIA is going to buy ARM? I think they're dang sure going to try. I think that NVIDIA, if they weren't worried about the regulatory component of it, 
they probably already would have. What? <sighs> it makes sense. Well, it it's... <laughs> it makes sense for both companies. SoftBank overpaid for ARM a long time ago, and this would sort of fix that, at least in my opinion. I think I think SoftBank, SoftBank got bamboozled because ARM is cool, but ARM doesn't have didn't have that visionary leadership at the time. Well, ARM has grown so much in the past five years. Yeah. But, of course, they don't actually make chips. They make license fees, which isn't the same thing. I mean, it's nice, but... Um, and, of course, we don't know what their current revenue is because they're obviously privately owned at the moment. I would think that NVIDIA would have to pay way more than SoftBank. If memory serves, SoftBank yeah. paid, tw- what, 24 million euros? Or no, 24 million pounds, which is, what, 32 million? 32 uh, million dollars? No, 36 I million dollars. I think it was something crazy. Or billion dollars. Uh, yeah, yeah, billion. Bi- bi- sorry, I say million. If it was million, then it just grabbed couch cushion <laughs> money. Um, hang on, let me let me check all the cushions over there. Thir- 30 billion or whatever it was. Uh, it was I mean, the number not- that comes to my mind is 100 billion, but that seems like it's a lot for some IP. But then again, look it's at all the lawsuits. 152 billion in revenue in 2017, according to Wikipedia, which is insane. That can't be right. Arms revenue? Oh no! Wait, uh, that's yen. I was Definitely. gonna say they're li- they just get license fees. There's no way they're making that <laughs> much revenue. I don't think. If they are, then uh, wow! I actually looked up TSMC's uh, financials the other day, and it was some trillions of dollars. And I, and I I tried to do a double take, and I oh wait, that's Taiwanese dollars. Never mind. <laughs> Yeah, their market cap, maybe. You know, I don't know. Uh, valued the company at 23 billion pounds, 32 billion US in 2016. The transaction was completed on the 5th of September 2016. Yeah, so that's that's completely crazy. How many patents does ARM have? A lot. It is a, it is a crazy war chest. Does that mean it's not totally crazy? Uh, I think that... Yeah, well, see, NVIDIA is in, in a really good position here because um, they may be able to buy ARM without actually spending much cash. They may be able to do a deal where it's like, okay, SoftBank, you invested this much money. Right now, ARM is not worth that. But we, NVIDIA has got this massive war chest, and we've got all this stuff. We've got the interconnects. We've got the machine learning. We need a processor. That's going to be ARM. And if we do that, then what is ARM... Uh, is going to be insanely way more valuable. So we're going to buy them, but we're going to sort of, you know, for the accounting purposes, keep track of them separately. And your investment can then have value as a result of our acquisition. And you'll get paid out of that. But we're not going to give you a lot of cash. And that would actually be a good deal for SoftBank. I'm curious as to why you think ARM's not worth $32 billion. It's, th- th- there's been so much consolidation in the market for so many other companies that unless ARM can play ball with a lot of other companies, they're kind of at other companies' mercy. And so they do have a lot of intellectual property, but they can't get really aggressive with their licensing or anything like that. Otherwise, they'll have a Qualcomm type situation on their hands because I don't think Qualcomm was really overly aggressive. But if you look at some of the transcripts with Apple and some of the other the cases where Apple was saying that you know Qualcomm was abusing their position with the 5G modem and some of the other stuff, I, I don't think it was overly aggressive. I don't think Qualcomm really did anything wrong there. I think that Apple was, was, was really the bad guy there. And ARM has been even more demure with this kind of stuff. And I think if they make any kind of rumbling or anything like that, people like Apple and some of the other people will like, oh, they're holding us hostage. They're trying to hold us hostage, blah, blah, blah. So I don't think that they're they're really in a, in a strong bargaining position, even though it's really just incredible. But that's good, though, because other people that are developing with ARM intellectual property probably have five and ten year deals. And they're going to get, you know, buku bucks out of whatever it is that they're developing on that platform. That may or may not go back to ARM, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure. So it's just more of a gut thing than it's like, oh, this is definitely not, not a good situation. But, but uh, I think that all of these companies investing in the ARM platform intrinsically makes ARM more valuable. 
And those companies probably know that when they're negotiating with ARM. And so ARM is like, okay, we'll give you a deal. Why doesn't Intel buy ARM? Uh, it's probably the same reason that NVIDIA would struggle is, uh, you know, the whole anti-competitive thing. App, Intel would be hard-pressed to demonstrate that they would be buying ARM for their patents and intellectual property because it would be difficult for ARM to incorporate their patents and intellectual property into their own. Alder Lake is coming, big little. Eight ARM cores, eight Intel cores. I think that they, they've, that those are those are things that have been in design for like five years. So, right, five but years that's ago, the, that's the art. Look, regular, regular ter, regulators don't know anything about technology. That's what you tell the regulator. <laughs> As evidenced by the Qualcomm trial. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm just, I'm, look, I'm just, pretend for a minute that we have no morals and we're just going to talk to the regulators and tell them what they want to hear. <laughs> I think that, it'll be uh, fine. See, we're going to do this. We're going to give the marketplace choice by creating processors that give people, let them do whatever they want. How amazing <laughs> is that? I really think Intel could learn a thing or two from ARM, especially in, in like the low power design stuff, because I just don't think that's ever been a priority. Can't, but that's what I was thinking earlier in our conversation when I talked about how old the x86, it's, you know, it's not risk, it's complex. It's possible... I am not a chip engineer. I mean, I'm obviously not an expert on, on CPU design, but it's possible that the inherent way that Intel has spent decades developing their product is it's just not well suited for that sort of approach of disabling sections of cores, disabling sections of the chip, powering things way down to insanely low voltage settings, whereas the ARM design is more optimized for it could Intel ever get an x86 CPU today down to half a watt? I think that the... Or less. I mean, they, they're supposed to... Like, some of the stuff uh, with, like, the die stacking thing is supposed to bring that kind of thing. I don't know. Time will tell. Because it's, it's, so, it's so complicated. There's an aspect of this that is, like, the technical debt of having to maintain all of this crap. And it might be just so complex that no human being on Earth can, except for like five people, can really understand it. Because it's so complicated. Because um, there, there was a thing that I ran into working on Looking Glass, which is a thing to help, you know, um, people do the whole virtual machine thing on Linux. And um, I discovered that when you're doing a memory-to-memory -memory copy, which is what we need for Looking Glass, like we get the frame buffer from the GPU into RAM via DMA, so the GPU does the work for us, and then we, we just read that same place in memory. So like one virtual machine writes it and another one reads it, but it's a memory operation. And I was experimenting with like the fastest way to do that. And um, I discovered that if you use the, the Intel 386 style instructions on an Intel processor, it definitely doesn't actually execute Intel 386 instructions. So like I'm looking at the machine code, like the actual assembler code in the binary that is executing across the processor, and it's doing 386 style copies through the EAX register, like EAX and EDX, and it is happening at such a rate that I know the processor is lying to me. Like there is no way that it's actually copying data through the EAX and EDX registers. And it turns out that there's microcode in the processor that's like, oh, this looks like a memory copy. Let's just ignore those instructions and actually do a really fast memory copy with the SIMD instructions or something like that. You, you're, you're referring to the, um, to the fact that internally it's not really an x86 CPU anymore. They've just built a hardware emulator in front of it. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, that's a whole other level of, you know, because... But Those doesn't things... that just make the chip insanely complicated in the long run? Year after year after year? The chip and the software? That's what I mean. It's like, maybe it's so complicated that literally it's like, how are we going to make this thing low power? And it's like... Because you can't shut just... parts of those off without breaking something. Or what happens if you create a low power version, but it breaks 386 compatibility? Yeah, exactly. And But it's funny because on on AMD processors... They don't, there's no optimization there for 32-bit code, but in whatever AMD's equivalent of microcode is for 64-bit, there totally is. So if you're doing a memory copy on AMD processors and you're doing it in an inefficient way, it just, the, the hardware seems to optimize that away. But the AMD processor doesn't optimize it away, at least it did not the last time I checked, 
on a 32-bit memory copy, only a 64-bit memory copy, but Intel does it with both 32 and 64-bit memory copies. And in fact, there's practically no difference between a 32 and a 64-bit memory copy speed, which is should tell you that something is not right. But like, are somebody... we going to be running x86 CPUs in 15 years? <laughs> that makes me think the answer is no, because what level of insane do you have to be to maintain that level of functionality? I mean, that's a that is a level of crazy that is you know heretofore unanticipated. You know, if Nvidia has 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 regulatory issues with buying ARM, and Intel would have the same problem, what about AMD buying them? AMD didn't uh, have the money. I mean, I think that probably like the, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, they it's could do a one, merger, but they probably couldn't afford to buy them. I don't know. They're gonna have a lot of money soon. You think so? I'm surprised. You know, one thing that came out of that Intel call, even though it's like everybody's all focused on the the processes and the seven nanometer slippage, but Intel's making a lot of money, like a lot of money. They're, they, they, you could almost give them a printing press, and they'd have a hard time making it faster. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's yeah. just go up to an unlimited ATM machine and press the button over and over. To make, it's they, they had record earnings. They're forecasting the full year to be the highest in his the highest in their company history. Um, they made twenty one billion in net income last year. AMD made three hundred and forty one million. Yeah. Intel earned. In six and a half days, what AMD earned all year, the, the the scale difference between these companies, AMD did six and a half billion of total sales and Intel did 71 billion. Yeah. It's David yeah. and Goliath if there ever was one. There's, a, there's definitely Buy something AMD weird. and support the underdog. <laughs> there's definitely something weird going on with those numbers, though, because I think what has happened is we got, we got the uh, Skylake processors and we get, you know, the hyperscalers like Amazon are buying just crazy amounts. I think that um, Intel probably made a really amazing sweetheart deal with like Amazon and some of the other hyperscalers that were like, look, we're going to sell you, you know, uh, Cascade Lake processors that will just drop in, upgrade your existing Skylake machines, and we will make you like the best deal ever. Please just buy an insane amount of processors. Because once the R&D is sunk, the cost of making that processor, that $10,000 processor is on the order of like $100. And you, you got to charge more than $100 because the R&D cost is so insane. Yeah. And spinning up your fab and all the things that didn't work, you got to pay for that. Um, but, you know, that will fix things for a quarter or two or three or a year or two or three. But, you know, your competition just keeps on moving forward. So I think if, if the revenue... You think is, Intel's on borrowed time. Yeah, if that's true, then Intel's on borrowed time because you can only do that a couple of times. And if you're if you're Amazon and you're looking at it, you're looking at it and it's like, okay, we've got these amazing new Epic chips, which are unquestionably hands down better in just about every way uh, for our needs. For we got encrypted memory, which is great, and performance and blah blah blah. But we have literally probably a million or two rack mount servers, and we could drop, we could take, we could pull out a twelve core or an eighteen core socket 3647 xeon and drop in a 28 core which is the, the the best cpu like the best of the best silicon from cascade lake we can you take those 12 or 16 core 10 core 12 core 16 core high clock speed and replace them with 28 core high clock speed same wattage same tdp it's going to work just fine in that chassis we can get another two three years out of those chassis or we can do a complete replacement new chassis new motherboards new epic cpus if you're the validation AD. testing yeah yeah Pe people who have one computer don't appreciate what it's like to validate uh, now i've never done anything at that scale but even just installing 25 or 50 computers in a small business you don't just change things willy-nilly without making sure that whatever I mean, I remember years and years and years ago, um, the first really cool network install I did, now this was in the Windows 95 days, <laughs> this is a long time ago, but it was, it was a home construction company that needed to replace their old, they had three, this was in the late 90s, the year 2000 was coming up, 
and they had 386s in the office still. And the reason they had 386s in the office, they, they built houses, but what they had is they had the specialized program that would track the cost of building houses down to the nails. I mean, every single expense, every, every budget item, they had this specialized program that was way too expensive, you know, a vertical software program that very few people are gonna buy. They were running a Wang terminal emulator on 386s for a program that was written in the 80s <laughs> in 1997. Yeah. And the year 2000 was coming up shortly and they're like, maybe it's time to move. And <laughs> that, that the company that had written their program, long since out of business, no support, everything just worked so long as it didn't touch anything. <laughs> Uh, you've never heard of that happening before, have you? Yeah, no. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's like and you so sold a printer, and then now them. we can't boot. Oh, God, yeah. It's, and if anything goes wrong, and of course, they're long since past replacement parts. So, But the point is, um, they made the decision to just go ahead and bite the bullet and join the 21st century. They were going to buy a all-new vertical program. It was really expensive, tens of thousands of dollars for the software program, plus annual license fees. But they're like, let's get on new systems. And so we set them up with like Pentium 75s or whatever they were and Windows 95 on the workstations and Windows NT4 on the, on the server. And we got all that set up and they were happy for 18 months, but then they wanted, then Windows, this was in 97. Then of course a year later, Windows 98 came out and they're like, do we go to Windows 98? Do we go to NT4? And I remember getting a call from them saying, um, hey, uh, we're just going to install Windows 98 on these machines. That's fine, right? And I'm like, no, don't. What are you doing? Have you <laughs> tested to see if your expensive software program even works on them? Why wouldn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> what if you install that on your main machines and they don't work? How are you going to work tomorrow? You have <laughs> dozens of employees. You pay a lot of money to show up and do stuff. You have to test this. Anyway, sorry. I just... That's sort of my story that I, I keep dragging out every time I've talked to somebody over the years. Um, yeah, the, the amount shocked. of problems that you're going to have just dropping in a processor that's got more cores and the same everything is practically zero. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but you could still, I mean, you know, what if you have a program that does not handle cores? There was a few situations when Threadrippers first came out where they didn't know what to do with 16 cores and 32 threads. <laughs> Windows is still like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, stop writing Windows on workstation CPUs. Um, <laughs> so the thing is, I don't understand why Intel, if they want to hold market share, if Intel is afraid of this. There's, I can't, if you disagree, tell me. I have been saying this for like ever since Zen 2 launched, which I love Zen 2. It's, it, it kind of resolves most of my complaints with Zen 1. Why does Intel not come out with an eight core 16 thread drop-in chip to put into uh, Z87, Z97, Z170, and Z270 motherboards for existing customers who <laughs> oh, don't, no want to rep how many people would just pay the five hundred dollars and just drop it in place and not have to freaking screw with their computer <laughs> that's a that's a dangerous idea that's that, well, that'll get you uh that'll get you dismissed from intel that's why just, that's that's just not how we do things yes it but you would sell all the chips <laughs> you would sell no. you no. you would protect yourself against market share because who wants to buy a new motherboard reinstall windows figuring out if their rams compatible screw with bios issues chip drop works why <laughs> tell tell me if you have a quality z97 has well refreshed motherboard why is it technically not possible to make a version of the 9900K that can drop into that. It would probably be a little slower just on for power delivery reasons, but yeah, the, it's the same DMI, it's the same pretty much everything else. If it runs I, two or 300 megahertz slower, I think most people would be okay with that if it means that they can go from four cores to eight cores in five minutes flat. There are some uh, Chinese vendors that have just cobbled together motherboards that do have, I mean, it's basically a Z270 chipset, but it'll work with anything from sixth generation to 
at least eighth generation, maybe ninth generation as well. Um, and it's you know it's it's quirks because insanity, but yeah, I mean it's that's a thing. Like that's that's actually a thing. There's um, uh, quite famously, uh, I think it was the eighty eighty six K at five gigahertz. There's a BIOS hack for a couple two Z, the higher end Z two seventy motherboards. And you can run that thing at 5 gigahertz all day long. And it's like, well, these motherboards have ridiculous power delivery. So running 5 gigahertz on six cores with a CPU, not a problem. Even though those motherboards were available when, you know, the 60, 600K came out and it was only a four core. Yeah, but if you have a premium board with premium power delivery, and I mean, obviously if somebody has some Dell Optiplex pre-built, that's a different story, but... You know, I guess this comes back to sophisticated uh, tech users as opposed to, you know, um, the unwashed masses, as you put it. I don't want to use those words, but you're right. (laughs) It's just, let me put it this way. As we speak, my wife is in the other room using an i7-4790K on a very nice Asus Z97 Pro motherboard. It's got 32 gigs of DDR3 2400 megahertz RAM. It's got a nice power supply. It's in a nice case. I mean, granted, obviously, there's been other improvements. DDR4 is a bit nicer. Multiple M.2 slots are nice. Uh, uh, You know, DMI has been improved. There have been other improvements. But for Pete's sakes, if I could drop an eight core chip into that, why throw it away? Yeah. Yeah, there's a perhaps the best example of your point is. uh, the Azeroth Desk Mini. I've got the Intel Desk Mini yeah. and the AMD Desk Mini. And the Intel Desk Mini, it holds a couple of processors from like three years ago. And that Desk Mini, it looks like it's going to get support for uh, newer stuff, like newer APUs, like eight core APUs. And it's like, oh, what? What? As long as it's like 65 watts, as long as it fits within the power and thermal. But the new Ryzen components? 740 700G should work in there, shouldn't it? Probably because it's it's physically compatible. It's just it's down to a software thing, and it's like, will that thing demand more power than its little VRMs can keep up with? Might might be a little little bit of an underclock, but if they can figure that out, it's going to work and be fine. You know, here's a question I don't know the answer to. Could they could Asrock release a BIOS update for the 4700G and have it stock? speed be 200 megahertz slower than it would be on a desktop to accommodate the fact that they know the platform that's going on yeah oh yeah is that an option that they could do would amd let them do that yeah that that would be the question like technically there's no problem with that i don't know if that would make amd angry but yeah i mean does amd allow them to set it's like well we know that this is what like the the CPU was supposed to do, but we know that our little mini computer isn't that, so we're going to... Because the concern from AMD's point of view would be the customer bought a CPU after seeing the benchmarks and seeing the reviews because, you know, we took their low-power APU and we put it on a 400R motherboard test bench (laughs) 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 with a a Noctua at HD15. (laughs) It's funny. When I got the uh, Ryzen 3 3100 from AMD to benchmark... Um, it went on to my uh, X570 MSI Ace $370 motherboard, and I've kind of... <laughs> I'm sort of sitting there looking at it going, the motherboard and the cooler are five times the price of the CP. <laughs> it's so stupid. Um... But see, that's the great thing about the, the AM4 CPUs is that basically everything's on the CPU, so you don't even really need a chipset. Like, you could get by without a chipset and still have some USB connectivity and some of the other stuff. So you can just shove that CPU into a potato, and it, it doesn't matter. I'm picturing a potato with a CPU stuck in <laughs> just, just shove a VGA port in the back of it, <laughs> a couple of AA batteries, and you're good to go. I thought the potato was a battery. <laughs> So, so Intel, 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 man, they just, do they, okay, this is going to sound like a harsh question. Uh, what are the odds that Bob is still the CEO in three years? Zero. I think he's going to be out. I think he's going to be out real soon. And it's not that he's a, he's a terrible CEO. It's just that he he's an accountant, and I've dealt with a lot of accountants, and there's a certain accounting personality type where they're bean counters, and he is 
bean counting to the nth degree on the earning calls. And that's not a bad thing necessarily. I mean, it's returns, shareholder investment. I mean, there's, there's nothing to fault there. But you can be perfectly technically correct and still incorrect with the technology. And so I think that they need somebody that is a visionary with the technology in that position. Does it have to be the CEO? No, it absolutely does not have to be the CEO. But I don't know how they're going to get there. At least from the outside looking in, I don't see enough of the like passionate pizzazz for CPU technology. That was one of the things that really like bothered me. On the 20, at the 2018 Computex, we were kind of talking before we started re- recording, and in 2018, it was like, they were, yeah, they showed off the 5 gigahertz 28-core CPU. I have one. and uh, But then they were like, look at all this other stuff that we're doing other than CPUs. And it was like, I mean, that's cool. That's where their earnings are coming from now. So they were apparently correct to hedge their bets, even though they're kind of getting out of 5G, the, some of the 5G stuff, and the earnings from that came up on their call. So it's good to diversify, and they're sort of like, let's de-emphasize you know, desktop processors and, and where that is. But the fact of the matter is that, like, Intel, the process leader, does not have to go away. They have the power and resources and money to invent new process technologies. They can be the Bell Labs of semiconductor development. It seems like they're just kind of sitting around for, like, you know, some material scientist somewhere to be like, let's, let's do this. And then they, you know, will quietly abdicate and focus on their you know, flash products and other, other products like that. But that's not, you know, that's not the Intel that has been historically. I want to see the Intel that wakes up after, you know, the Athlon X2, where it's just like, you know, all that brilliance and brain power of all of those employees, because all of those people at Intel are super smart. They know what they're doing. Maybe it's just managerial interference. I guarantee you there are people inside Intel that know what needs to be done. But for some reason, it makes somebody uncomfortable somewhere and they're not willing to do it. And I don't know what that is, but I guarantee you that there are people that know exactly what needs to be done. They just don't have the freedom to do it, and it's driving them insane. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going from memory here, but when the Pentium 4 was out and Intel thought NetBurst was the second coming of CPUs, it wasn't the main Intel development people or management that that developed the initial core and core two CPUs. Wasn't it Intel Israel that did that? Yeah, no, it totally was. It was Intel Israel. But the reason for that, well, the, the, the Israeli team really pulled a rabbit out of a hat with that. And it was a different team, but they were like, you know, let's go off in a room and let's, let's, let's do all this. There's actually a book about this, which is really, really good. Um, that I read a long, long time ago. But the thing that, the thing that was not, that was indirectly stated in the book but from one of the people on the team, from what I understand, all of the Intel engineers, like the, the old school Intel engineers, were busy working on Itanium as a replacement for NetBurst, not Core. And so it was a business decision that made Core successful in the market because of like, that's what businesses wanted. But in terms of like top-down engineering, it's like, no, we are going to do Itanium. x86 is dead. We have to move to Itanium. Titanium is the better engineering. It's the better this, that, and the other. And it's not, they're not wrong. I mean, Titanium actually does have a lot of really incredible engineering in it. It's all of the lessons learned, all the things, all the things we did wrong are not there in Titanium. But it was not what the market wanted because of compatibility. So, speaking of compatibility, how hard would it be for Apple? I was trying to say this a minute ago, well, a minute ago, 20 minutes ago, when I said um, about the Power Mac change and the move from OS 9, what I was really getting at was the move from OS 9 to OS 10 or OS X, depending on which person you want to listen to. Uh, They created the classic mode to allow you to run the old OS 9 programs for backwards compatibility. How hard would it be for Apple to write a layer in the Mac OS to continue to run Intel programs on the new ARM MacBook Pros? Well, they're, they're doing that with Rosetta, but the difference between uh, Rosetta, um, old Rosetta and new Rosetta, is that instead of doing it at runtime, there is a runtime component because there has to be a runtime component for things like Java applications, but not really because Java, but um, things that have a, a thing, thing like 
things like Java, but specifically not Java, because Java is going to be covered. But a JavaScript interpreter, there we go, an x86 JavaScript interpreter. They're going to have to deal with that at runtime. But mostly it deals with the translation at install time. So it takes the x86 binary, which and it will take a long time, relatively speaking, to convert that x86 binary into an ARM binary. But in the context of installing an application, oh, it takes an extra minute or two to install the application. Pfft, who cares? And then when that binary goes to run, instead of running the x86 version, it's going to run the ARM version. That's totally OK. But it's interesting that you mentioned the transition from OS 9 to OS 10 and the transition from PowerPC to Intel. Because uh, in terms of like hardware devices, like the whole Thunderbolt thing, FireWire was a transition. And the FireWire transition from FireWire to, Th to FireWire, uh, PowerPC to FireWire Intel, that did not go well. <laughs> and then also, Apple was so up poop creek with OS 9, they didn't know they needed it. They actually ousted Steve Jobs to have the CEO of Pepsi run Apple like a business because... And nobody was working on operating systems inside Apple. But Steve Jobs knew that uh, Apple had hit a wall with single core, and so he did Next. And so as part of Jobs' triumphant return to Apple, they bought Next, which became... OS 10, uh, Unix. That's where Unix came from. So literally, Apple was so clueless, they had no idea. And Steve Jobs knew that it's like, yeah, OS 9 is going to be our big Achilles heel. And then he was like, oh, look, we got next. Oh, yeah, you're going to switch you know, to new operating systems. And new st oh, look at that. Oh, it's Unix. Here I come. I'm coming back to the company to save it because the CEO of a soft drink company running Apple, not a good idea. He did save it. I don't think we'd have Apple today if Steve Jobs hadn't come back. I think that's probably true. Because you can't, you know, there, was, there wasn't Scully, anything but, there for anybody to care yeah. about. Yeah, it's like running a computer products company is just not, not a, I have a very low opinion of Steve Jobs, but he's like a, you know, he's a very grumpy, like tenacious thing, and he will latch onto something. And just by sh just annoying everybody around him and being terrible, he will bring out the best in everybody. But it could also be that, you know, he will wring every good thing out of you and make you hate life. And then it's like, okay, but look, look at this wonderful, amazing result. And that was just because he was so tenacious. Well, he might have been a, a, a rough person, and he screwed over a lot of people. In fact, there's a famous story about how before they even really got into Apple, um, he screwed over Steve, Steve Wozniak, his partner. Oh, yeah. On yep. the Atari, was it the Atari 2600 board or the Atari where he got the chips down from like 100 or 50 down to, you know, like I, half a dozen? I think it was Breakout. I think it, like when Wozniak wrote Breakout, I don't think Steve Jobs gave him as much money as he was supposed to have. No, there was, he, was, uh, he told him he was going to split the money with him, but he lied to Steve Wozniak about how much money Atari gave him. And for whatever reason, Steve Wozniak forgave him for that and let it go and just yeah. decided okay you know that's 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 jobs what do you want you know that's that's yeah. who he is yeah and if you don't like it then you should never talk to him and if you you know it's it, it man that that's he's an interesting character have you ever have you ever met wasn't yet i think um no i talked to him online once but uh, i've never met him in person that would be a fun guest to have on a show. <laughs> Maybe when we get a million subs. <laughs> I mean, just like, look, I'll just be quiet and listen. I'll just learn something. <laughs> it's there's uh, my first computer was an Apple II, and I, well, <clears throat> hang on a second because I got the CPUs on it, but <clears throat> I'm annoyed at the lockdown controlling nature of Apple in many ways. However, if you would like to know what kind of a Apple fan I am. <laughs> oh, look at that. That's a 2GS. I got one of those in the basement. This I did not buy off of eBay. I've owned this since the 1980s. This is my original <laughs> 2GS. I have six boxes over there of all my original software from the 80s. I kept everything. <laughs> and it works. And I've, I've played a couple of games on this with my oldest son. And, and the 2GS is also a good example of Steve Jobs' ego problem because Steve, the Mac was his pet project. And so he wanted to make sure that the Mac, think about this for a minute. 
the Macintosh, the the the, the all in one nonsense thing was like two grand, twenty five hundred back in the eighties. It had a black and white screen. It had poor sound, but it had a high clock speed. It had the Motorola sixty eight thousand and it's seven or eight megahertz or whatever it was. The Apple II GS CPU is stuck at two point eight megahertz, although you can fix that today. Um, the Western Design Center chip or I forget the model, whatever it is. It was capable of running at like four or five megahertz, but he insisted it be down clock because they didn't want the 2GS to cannibalize the Mac sales. But the 2GS has, it, it wasn't until like the Sound Blaster 16 was out before <laughs> the PC yeah. had sound like that. That had like a, it had an Insonic, uh, you know what? I want to make a liar out of myself, but it had multiple voices on a genuine sound chip. It had uh, graphics. It it could have been awesome. Jobs in the stupid Mac. Um, don't even get me started about that because that machine should have been amazing. That was so far ahead of almost everything except the Amiga. Uh, I mean, Commodore 128, give me a break. You know, the, the Atari <laughs> ST, yeah. get out of here. The PC with the with the speaker and EVGA graphics for four grand, go away. You know, this thing was amazing. And they charged, mind, mind you know, monitor, um, in the late 80s, $999 for that. Hmm. It, what a deal. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad. Why didn't <laughs> we all have one? <laughs> Freaking stupid Steve Jobs. Yeah, it's like, you buy the Macintosh. And then they, 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 at the last minute, it's like, oh, the cost is too high. Let's take all the memory out of it. And it's like, oh, it's going to run bad. Oh, that argument has never gone away. I'm still having that argument today. I, I oh, my goodness. Um, we just talked about a deal this past week. Um, 64 gigs of DDR4 3200 is now 199 on New <laughs> Buy it. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. <laughs> I, I did a live stream less than a week ago pitching the heck out of that deal to my audience going 60, look, if you're building a Ryzen 9 or an i9, if you want a multitask live stream, if you want a machine for the next three to five years, for 200 bucks, yeah, get 64 gigs. Look, you're running Windows. It sucks in memory management. Just get the 64 gigs. To be, that solves all your problems. With 64 gigs, you can have three copies of Chrome open. <laughs> you can even run the next version of Chrome. So, but I kid you not, I get people in my live chat coming along going, you don't need that much RAM. I've got eight gigs and it's just fine. Mm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay. You could be technically correct and say that eight gigabytes of RAM in 2020 does in fact work. Um, why would you do that? Eh, I mean, you know, a 486 is probably still usable. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, if you run the programs that were out when a 486 was out, sure, you know. Um, I mean, and I get that if somebody has a 10-year-old, you know, Phenom or somebody has a Core 2 quad and they're running old programs, I mean, okay, fair enough if they're still running Windows 7. But why would you build a new computer with 8 plus cores in 2020 and not at the minimum put 32 gigs of RAM in it? Yeah. Yeah. But I actually I mean, have a lot of people send me like part specs over on our, I mean, they'll, they'll tweet at me or they'll, you know, say, hey, here's my, you know, part specs I'm putting together. And it'll be a Ryzen 7 3700X. It'll be a RX 5700 XT. It'll be, you know, all this SSD space and it'll be 16 gigs of RAM. Yeah. Yeah. It just depends. I if mean, you disagree, tell me. It's okay if you disagree. You can tell me I'm crazy. Well, no. I mean, if you, 64 gigs of memory for $200 is really good because I think uh, around Christmas, I think I was paying $120, $130 for 16 gigs. And so it's like, oh, $50 more and you can go 64 gigs. But with that kind of memory density, you also get a little bit of a speed bump. So even if it's not 3,600, if it's 3,200, that memory density has more ranks, which can be made busy in parallel with the other ranks so 
you still get a little bit of a, a performance bump even if it's not the top end speed but having more memory means that literally everything is faster because you know switching context and doing everything else like that and you'll never really need to upgrade so it really it just depends on how tight your your budget is if it was a choice between 16 gigs of memory and a 3900x or a 3700x and and 64 gigs of memory i do the 3900x with 16 gigs but barring that yeah uh well, I would agree with you because you can always drop more memory in, whereas you can't glue on four more yeah. cores. But at the same time, I would turn that around and say anybody who's got a $400 budget for a CPU, um, it's like don't don't put the budget tires on the Ferrari <laughs> and don't yeah. put the $2,000 tires on the you know, budget car, it's, it's put the components that go together. And of course there's, there's the middle of the road, which is 32. I mean, if, if 64 is too much for some people, that's fine. Um, but 32 gigs is a hundred right now. I think you save $42 by going to 16 instead of 32. I think that's $42 poorly saved, but that's me. Yeah. That's like the price of a pizza. It's like, I'm going to get a large pizza for everybody and a couple of drinks. It's like, Oh my gosh, it's like $38. How did that happen? And I mean, and I'm talking about new builds, mind you. I mean, if you've got a three-year-old build and you're waiting one more year to upgrade, I get it. But if you're like putting together a fifteen hundred to two thousand R machine today in 2020, and I only bring that up because you mentioned the the lack of RAM, because didn't they take, didn't you take half the RAM out of the first Mac? I think it was two thirds, uh, and it was to, it was because it was too expensive, and it was the only thing they could take out. But it ran terrible with that amount of memory. It probably would have had more. No, uptake. you're right. I, you're absolutely right. I remember because they came out with the 512K Mac shortly thereafter. The first yeah. Mac, I had completely forgotten about that, had 128K of RAM <laughs> yeah. with a GUI. Yeah. What? I, compl- <laughs> I, you know what? I had blacked that out of my memory out of, out of sheer self-preservation. <laughs> 128K, yeah. the original Mac was 128K trying to run... A graphical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was surprisingly good. You're being generous. You know. They didn't, I mean, virtual memory on a SCSI hard drive was not great then either because the, the hard drive would have a transfer rate of about 600 kilobytes per second, which, you know. I think in the not too distant future, people are going to look back at you know, the wonder that is a mechanical hard drive and be like, this stores information? What, What is this? This is crazy. It's almost like looking, I mean, at a record today, it's like, you mean these little grooves is a plastic representation of sound waves? Yeah. And we literally just drag things across it and that reproduces the sound? Uh-huh. And it's like, you mean to tell me there's, there's you know, t- hundreds of millions of little tiny magnetic pits on this spinny thing and then we've got this electromagnetic arm that physically moves to read and write those and this thing works reliably that seems that seems improbable speaking of improbable i have recently set up and my own audience fell over when i told them this because i have been arguing against it for actually about two years now but I, I actually have a working functioning NAS in my office. And I've tried several different ways of doing storage. I tried doing the, the old solution that you uh, oh, yeah. encouraged yeah. me to try. It's amazing. We still use that. Uh, it's actually still sitting. You can't see it, but it's still <laughs> sitting right over there. It has not moved. No. I, I've heard you can hit up Samsung. Samsung is, is gung-ho to sponsor people. It's like, look, I have this amazing dish shelf. Please send me 10 terabyte hard drives. Well, here's the thing. Um, I, I played with FreeNAS just long enough to, to realize that that becomes something that you have to mentally wrap your head around and you have to spend more time with. And I, I want it, you know... I played with it, and I'm I'm configuring various things in FreeNAS. Uh, I'm sure version. for your audience, this is old hat. There's a there's a new version. They've seen the light. They understand that there's a, a learning curve. Let's say in a, the nicest possible way. I mean, I love FreeNAS. Don't get me wrong. Those guys, IX Systems, are great. TrueNAS. There's TrueNAS Core, FreeBSD. TrueNAS Scale, Linux, because the Linux version gives you all of the 
virtual machine goodness from competing products. And it's a totally different GUI. So it might be more what you're looking for. I'm sorry, go on. Oh, now you want me to go try it. <laughs> well, I it's broke it down. I don't, please, please don't <laughs> yell at me. Don't judge me. <laughs> Wait, what do the millennials say these days? Don't at me. <laughs> don't at me, yeah. Uh, do I sound hip when I say that, or do I just sound out of place? I feel young at heart. Um, <laughs> I have a Synology. They're not bad. They're not bad if you want something that is running in 30 minutes. Yeah. If, if I, I ultimately went that route for the simple reason that I wanted something that I could go put in the corner, that I could turn on, that I could log into a web interface, literally just click a few things, set it up, set up user permissions, set up a volume, hit go, go over to my Windows computer, type in share, hit slash slash NAS1, enter, there's the drive, share, done. Um, it really is a 30 minute setup and there really is no knowledge required to use one other than like basically understanding general concepts, you know, a little bit of reading, but I spent several hours messing with FreeNAS and maybe I should, it's been a while, uh, in fairness, it's been many months. I should probably try the new version. I mean, I still have the original hardware sitting over there, so I probably should, uh, make a good video. Well, they're, they're definitely worried about people, you know, because the, the GUI and stuff's different. So there is still FreeNAS. But there's also TrueNAS Core and TrueNAS Scale. TrueNAS Scale is a little more alpha than TrueNAS Core. I think TrueNAS Core just entered beta. But it's a reasonable, a much more reasonable experience in my opinion. Okay. Well, I will have to take a look at that. Um, I went that route though. I mean, I, I needed to do something because I was running basically on USB hard drives. And there comes a point at where, I mean, you know, you, you could do that to a point, but um, I had six, Teen USB hard drives. It works, mm. um, but does they were all. I'm sorry. Does it though? <laughs> yes, it does. Well, here's the thing. In a single user environment, here's what kind of got me over the fence. In a single user environment, having a lot of USB drives that are mirrored and backed up. If you're just, if it's just you with your computer and your data, and you have an offsite backup, and you have your drives mirrored, what's wrong with that? Yeah. This is where you're supposed to say nothing. Yeah. It makes it hard to know when you've got. I mean, as long as you've got mirrors and stuff, but then it's like, does do all of the mirrors like? Do you ever lose something? Do you get bit rot that seeps in? you would have no way of knowing so that it's like, oh, one of these is going to be problematic the next time that I go to turn it on. Oh, I've got another copy over here. Oh, wait. I don't know. Well, you are correct, and I don't have a good answer to that other than to say that you're right. Um, when the data set becomes important and it grows large, you're not, you're not wrong. Um, by the way, can you explain to me why we never got the updated file system that was supposed to be in Longhorn, and then they promised with, what was it, R... Uh, uh, ReFS? Re what? ReFS? Yeah, that. Thank you. It is It is actually a thing. So ReFS is a thing that exists now, um, but Microsoft kind of went in a different direction. They have uh, Microsoft System Center Data Protection Manager or something like that. I don't, I don't actually work on that, um, but the idea with the Data Protection Manager is that you just tag a data set and be like, this is critical. And then all this machinery sort of kicks off. So it's like your branch offices get a replica and then your offsite backup gets a replica and then like your cold storage or your tape library or your tape vault or whatever gets a replica. The vision that all of these uh, software defined storage, I've actually got a video coming out on software defined storage, but the, the vision that all of these companies have with software defined storage, which is a marketing buzzword, is that a system administrator can just create a data set and then just tag the data set and then the different layers of software handle stuff. So like in the case of ZFS, um, where you, you create, you know, at creation time um, of your Z pool, you decide how many VDEVs you have and what level of redundancy each VDEV has. In a sort of more modern architecture, you just sort of do that on the fly. You add disks to the pool 
and then you create a data set in the pool and you say, I want this level of redundancy, I need five copies of it, and it's, it's on the local pool. But the, um, the, the universe of all of the storage is not just the local storage on the machine. You have different tiers of storage. You can have mechanical disks and SSD. You can have different tiers of SSD. You can have SATA or SAS SSDs plus NVMe SSDs. You can have Optane NV DIMMs. All of those are different tiers of speed. But you can also have storage across campus, across the building, across the planet. And but that, all of the, that solution is great for the enterprise. And that yeah. solution is great for people who have many drives, multiple locations, and lots of people to manage. ReFS was never meant for anything else. Right, but why does the file system itself not have built-in checksumming and built-in parity on every file written? So if you have a single drive, why is that not protected against bit rot, as you say. Uh, if you have corrupted files or a bad sector, why can the operating system not just recover from that natively without needing all that management layer? Well, if depending on how the drive is failing, one drive may not be enough information to recover. I agree that the, the, the operating system and the file system should not trust the drive so that even if you do have a single drive that's failing, you get some indication of that. And that is definitely not the case with NTFS on anything right now and uh, you know Microsoft's actually moved backwards with this a little bit because you know Windows XP had shadow copy and it had a wonderful brilliant implementation of shadow copy and then there was kind of this push to have Windows 10 on uh, more anemic lower horsepower devices and, and shadow copy was on the chopping block and so there's kind of shadow copy in Windows 10 but it is a shadow uh, of its former self of its former functionality um, and that makes me really sad, and it's also terrible. Like, they replace it with this Windows file backup whatever, and it's really just a thin veneer to try to push you toward, like, keeping all of your files in the cloud and just worrying about that for backup. And Shadow Copy is uh, the foundation, like, snapshots and those kinds of things, and that is sort of the foundation of the kinds of functionality that you're looking for. It doesn't have checksumming, but layering on checksumming uh, with that kind of snapshot functionality would be the next logical step. Instead, they regressed because less overhead. Is it time to have a new file system that is designed in an era of flash storage? Yeah, I think so. I don't. NTFS doesn't cut it anymore. And uh, not only is it time for a new file system and flash storage, uh, you know, the whole move from SATA flash to NVMe was to get rid of some of the overhead. As we move to quad level cells and five level cells and six and seven level cells, uh, flash is getting shockingly unreliable. It's like, you know, the price of a flash hard drive really actually hasn't changed at all in the last few years. It's just the density. So, like, you know, buying a 200 gig flash drive, you got a certain amount of flash uh, a long time ago and it was like $1,000. But now with quad level cells, you can get a terabyte of flash. But it's, it's really not a lot less expensive than it was because the number of flash cells hasn't changed. We're just storing four bits per cell now instead of one. And so the endurance goes way, 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 way down. And so the controller on the flash uh, drive has to deal with sort of juggling that and making sure that the writes happen evenly across the whole drive. And I can tell you the Windows usage pattern, it's not even. It's nowhere, it's not even remotely even. And if it weren't for the controller on the NVMe sort of lying about which thing is written where and maintaining it's like, okay, here's our block map that we return to the operating system and here's our real block map and we're also going to reserve some space that the operating system can't even see that we keep stuff in. If yeah. it weren't for all of those things, the uh, flash drives that we have now would, would already be dead because some of the cells would be worn out. Well, you know, I, I, people get so worried, I think, sometimes about flash cells wearing out. If if the drive is well designed and the controller has spare area to remap into as cells die, so long as there's a way to monitor that, and of course the, the quality of SSD toolboxes is all over the place. You have Samsung and Crucial who are really good, and then you have a lot of El Cheapos who don't have anything at all. How do you know when your El Cheapo flash drive 
is 90% of its life is used. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are some of them report metrics. Some of them don't. Some of them actually, the firmware lies to you. Um, some of them have well-defined failure modes, like some of the Intel SSDs um, will go into a read-only mode. And so it's like, oh, we've reached end of life. Read only and get your stuff off. That's great. Uh, some drives, like the OCZ, remember like the OCZ like, that had the, the really amazing good deal? Oh, so, you mean many years ago? Yeah, yeah. And then they all died. Yeah. The reason they died is because they did the wear leveling thing really well. The, the one place where they didn't do the wear leveling is where the operating system loaded from. So when you plug those in, it's a computer. It's a computer within a computer. Plug that OCZ flash drive in. It boots up. It needs to read a decryption key and some other stuff because secure race. You know, that was a standard. And then, oh, that part of the flash worn out. That was not – that part of the flash was not wear leveled because it was like the low-level operating system part of the flash drive. Whoops. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't that be written into separate – memory or an EEPROM? Yeah. Money. <laughs> there are, you know what there we have... need to teach people? That taking the last three dollars off of a hundred dollar product is not worth taking off. Yeah. Yeah. There have been some drives where it just, you know, it just it just stops and it's just gone and then you know those kind of failure modes are sort of fun to deal with and a whole other chapter of insanity for data recovery places. But, Can we talk about backup? Because if you have a backup, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, if, if you all just subscribe people, to the cloud, the cloud will take care of everything. Like, what? You know, it's interesting that you say that. Um, I filmed a video a couple of days ago that's going to be quite long, and I have no idea if my audience is going to like it, but it's basically me going through my mental thought process as to how I went from a few drives to 16 USB drives, to a shockingly expensive NAS with some very nice drives. Oh, by the way, um, I've discovered the inherent difference in parity RAID between shingled magnetic recording Seagate archive drives and Seagate Exos Enterprise drives. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> Turns wow, out that's a large I, number. <laughs> I'm sorry? Turns out that's a large number. <laughs> uh, just, just, for anybody watching who missed or maybe on your channel who didn't didn't doesn't watch our long live streams because we do tend to do that sometimes um i put together a 64 terabyte uh, array in um basically raid 5 a synology hybrid RAID, but a single parity drive and it started the parity check process to read through and write all the data to make sure that you know in other words, the, it doesn't trust the drives. It reads and writes every byte on the drives to make sure that they're actually actually good. And so I stick 64 terabytes of shingled magnetic recording archive drives into this, and I start it going. And three days later, it still has 12 days left. <laughs> and this is just building the array. This is, I mean, you could still use it, but it hasn't been verified yet. This is the, yeah. the parity verification running through the whole drive. I stuck 64 terabytes of the Exos Enterprise drives in, and it was done in one day, four hours. <laughs> yeah. How much of that is product segmentation, and how much of that is bad product design? Uh, well, <laughs> the problem, the, the, are you asking me or telling me? I don't know. I mean, the way, like, shingle, theoretically, Shingled magnetic recording performance should not be that terrible. It shouldn't even be remotely that terrible. It seems like a lot of the performance issues there have to do with uh, bad handling in the firmware. And so like second, third, fourth generation shingled magnetic recording drives mm -hmm. may do a better job because they'll be able to juggle things the way that NVMe drives are juggling things. But hard drive manufacturers are not really used to doing that. Well, I think it's worth noting now... I have not used enough SMR drives to speak about this on a first person level at any great detail. But from my reading and research, there are shingled magnetic recording drives that are OS agnostic, meaning they handle all the internal translation and they do all the data protection internally. And they, they present themselves to an operating system as a normal hard drive. Yeah. And then you have SMR drives, which will let you 
do raw they'll they'll basically let you be stupid if you want to they expect the os to understand their topology and by having the os manage them it it lets you get around the fault you know the, the the drawbacks of smr um i suspect in a true enterprise environment where you had proper caches prop maybe an ssd cache maybe a dram cache or an optane cache in front of an os managed drive it wouldn't be that terrible but if you take four or eight um, firmware managed drives that don't let the OS know how the data really works, and you put them into a RAID 5 array, the random performance is just, it's literally 14 times worse. And yeah. I suspect that if I lost one of those drives and I had to resilver the array, it would literally take a month. You're probably going to lose another drive during that process as well. Because drives we, usually don't fail for no reason. Well, sure. In which case, you need a RAID 6 and then maybe and then two drives. What that tells me is that's not a functional solution. Yeah. And I've yeah. taken those out. And I I cried a little bit when I saw the price tag. Um, I took out the 64 terabytes of SMRs and I bought four more excess drives <laughs> you know, they're a really good deal right now. I mean, at, at $380 for an Enterprise 7200 RPM CMR drive, I don't know yeah. how Seagate's selling them that cheap, but, um, yeah. you know, it's still $1,500. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're our storage solution is almost full, and I want to get about 20, like 10 or 12 terabyte Enterprise drives, and it's just like, maybe I can find a channel sponsor. <laughs> It, it's <laughs> it's painful because they're they're part of my reasoning for buying the 16 terabyte drives. I would probably go with the midsize if I was putting them into the cheaper uh, 24 drive for you racks. That's what that's exactly what we're gonna do. But when you're putting them into a 12 drive Synology that was um, a lot more money, yeah, each drive bay costs a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And when the drive base costs money, it makes more sense to buy the more expensive drives. Because the 24 drive rack mount unit is loud. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's uh yeah, let's yeah. uh the uh I think that the operating systems will improve the way that they handle those things and I think that you know the the shingle magnetic recording drives that do try to leave it to the operating system to manage that, um, the operating systems will catch up, and we will have file systems that deal with those kinds of things better. I think, probably. You once said something that I have actually quoted to our viewers more than once, and I've given you credit, and I keep telling everybody <laughs> to go over there and follow you because I'm like, look, it you know, speaking of being out ahead. You once said that when LCDs, LCD screens came along, that it didn't take you very long to realize that CRTs were doomed. Yeah. There was no future in CRTs. Big, complicated, heavy vacuum tubes with electronics and shipping and size and electron guns and shadow masks were never going to win against printed sand. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, it, it might take a while, they would have to scale it up, but eventually they would literally just be printing LCDs in massive sheets and cutting them to size. Yep. Um, so there's no future in CRTs. I have kind of taken that and argued that there's no future in hard drives because think about the motor, the alignment, the heads, the yep. seek. You've got something that moves. <laughs> it's a, mar a marvel minimum of modern physics. <laughs> Eventually, printed flash should catch up. I mean, if you think that this is different than screens, by all means, you know, tell me. No. But I'm of the mindset that, that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. You know, SSDs don't have to become as cheap as hard drives. They just have to get close. Yeah. No, I think that's exactly right. Not only do they have to get, just get close, I think that... Um, most people don't need that much storage. Most people don't need 16 terabytes in there. In there. So it's a shrinking market as well. You and, mean everybody's not a YouTuber? Yeah, no. <laughs> and uh, 
the shrinking market is going to drive cost up of mechanical storage. And so I think we're going to see the, the market overall because, you know, when you've got neodymium and coils and the engineering and all the crap that goes into that, you expect a certain economy of scale. And because they are going to sell vastly smaller numbers of units, vastly smaller numbers of units, uh, that R&D cost is going to be amortized over a much, much smaller number of drives. And that is also going to force the cost to be higher. So either the density is going to stagnate. We're not going to put any more R&D into it. We're just going to try to get as much you know, time as we can out of our existing machinery, which probably also means the quality control is going to go down. Um, or the price of the drives is going to go up. And so only enterprises and hyperscalers and people like that are going to you know, buy the mechanical hard drives. But at this point, for like Facebook and Amazon and those people, spinning rust is too expensive and too much of a liability, too expensive in terms of the physical real estate that it occupies. Because you can get you know, the Intel ruler format, you can get 16 terabyte rulers. They're crazy expensive. But you can pack a petabyte in a 1U server. And so you're never going to do that with spinning rust and have it be anywhere remotely as reliable or fast as sand. And probably power consumption too. Yeah, yeah. I guess and at, at, at enterprise scale, I imagine that the electric bill at Facebook and Google is not minor. No, but you know they can make that problem go away with solar and by sinking their data centers in the ocean and crap like that. Yeah, but I just mean that flash uses less power than spinning hard drives do. I think that that's probably not true um, for... It depends on the workload. So reads, certainly. But writes, I don't know. I'm referring to density in that you don't need as many servers for the same amount of space. Yeah, that's true, too. Yeah, that's you, you can, true. You, can, yeah. you need far fewer installs... Yeah. I mean, if you can cut your racks down by 75%, that's where you cut your power. Yeah. Yeah, you would need physically less. That's true. Uh, it just depends on mechanical storage and density. I wonder if we'll see a return of, like, the old school, like, five and a quarter inch full height drives or, like, the Bigfoot drives as hard drive I manufacturers adapt to them. I Bigfoot drives. They were awful. <laughs> but they were so the big. The quantums. No, they were so slow. <laughs> But they were so big. You could get it like a six gigabyte hard drive for like nothing. Yeah, but they were, what, 3,600? I think the latter ones were a bit faster, but the first Bigfoots were 3,600 RPM. Yeah. They On a five, so the seek time was forever across that big platter. So here's the, here's the fun thing about those drives. They didn't really build new tooling for those drives. Those drives were built on old server tooling. So the hmm. old five and a quarter inch drives and like the SCSI drives were like really expensive for servers. Servers were moving toward 10,000 RPM hard drives, which required new tooling. And so I was like, crap, can we get some more? Like, what can we manufacture with this equipment that we already have for five and a quarter inch hard drives? Surely we don't have to scrap it for just the, the, the metal recycling cost. And it was like, aha, the Bigfoot drive. I've got a micro drive too. Do you remember those? A compact flash memory card, but it's a mechanical hard drive. Now that is an impressive piece of engineering. It's a tiny what? little mechanical hard drive the size of a compact flash card. Weren't those from IBM? Yep. Micro drive. drives or something? Micro drive, yeah. Micro, yeah. IBM, IBM micro drive. I've got one that's, that's eight gigabytes and it's an eight gigabyte and it was like $2,000 when it was new. I didn't get it new, I got it used. Uh -huh. And uh, it is insane. I, I would like to introduce you to a $25, 256 gig <laughs> yeah. SD card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I remember our first digital camera in the 90s. We bought a Kodak digital camera that was awful. It had two megabytes of internal memory and you could put an eight megabyte compact flash card in it that was like a hundred bucks or something. <laughs> and it would take 20 pictures before it was full. And it was big and clunky, and it was way too expensive. And um, I knew a professional photographer at the time who looked at this and thought it was a toy and a joke. And I remember to this day their comment saying, you yeah, know, that's cute and that's nice, but it's never going to replace a good 35 millimeter camera. <laughs> Give it time. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> How's 
that working for you? Oh, speaking of replacing 35 millimeter cameras, um, uh, this probably doesn't matter as much in your world, but have you heard that Blackmagic has just released a 12K camera? Yeah, it looks really crazy. I, you know, we're, we're in a little bit, I think we're in a little bit of a pixel race here because 12K and like 12K and, you know, 12K are not all the same thing. But uh, it is nuts. And I think it's to compete with the 8K, like the Canon R5. We get the R5 and the R6, and it's like, oh, the R5 is better than the R6 for some things. But it's like, oh, you know, what's going on with that? And, um, yeah, it looks completely nuts. But it's like the old school 4K, like when 4K was a new thing. You could get a 1080p camera that had a much higher quality than, like, those first-generation 4K cameras. And now you can get an amazing 4K camera that has just incredible quality. But, you know, editing is a struggle and some of the other stuff is a struggle. And now we've got 8 and 12K cameras that, yeah, they have 8 and 12K worth of pixels, but there's some side effects. Well, the interesting thing I didn't think about with the 12K camera, it didn't even occur to me, and I can't take credit for having thought of this because... Um, our good friend, the the big boy of the tech YouTube industry, Linus, uh, I don't know if you've heard this, but he has ordered some of those. Yeah, it'll be fun to experiment with. I mean, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how those stack up against his reds, but I have a feeling the reds are going to be better. Uh, you know, that's an interesting thing because he talked about this recently, and he's curious about that too because he, he knows that exactly what you said, that just because they're 12K doesn't mean they're better. Than, I mean, the reds are expensive for a reason, partly because they just they can. Um, but the the new Black Magic cameras are way less expensive, yeah. and so the question is, the 8K Red cameras might be a little better in the real world, but are they the cost of a house better? <laughs> because the Black Magic 12K cameras are only 10 grand a piece. Yeah, and the Reds are like 80. Yeah, and of course I say only ten grand, but in the scheme of that world, yeah, only ten grand. Um, which is why, for some reason, Linus thought that he had to order six of them. <laughs> He'll send them back if, if if he doesn't like them. Don't worry. <laughs> He's actually under the impression that he doesn't have to do that. He thinks that Black Magic doesn't isn't going to make enough of these, and he figures he can either a uh, use them or b flip them on eBay for a profit. <laughs> He's probably not wrong about that. He's he's got a, a keen sense for things like that. And so if if they work out, then he'll sell his reds and actually come out ahead. And if he's wrong, then yeah, he can either return them or sell them. Or I, I think the reason he bought six is because he's kind of looking at them, going, "How do I lose?" Yeah. You know, I have this expensive stuff, and so we'll. And of course, he's got a lot of older cameras as well that. He's like, we're just going to consolidate and have all of our cameras be the same so that we don't have to mess with, you know, four different types of cameras. Um, do you see the data rate on those cameras? Uh, Speaking the, of data, and this is part of the reason I thought of it was the data rate. They will record uncompressed raw at over 2.2 um, Gigabit? gigabytes per second. Wow. That's they fast. take an NVMe SSD. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it would take. And um, they actually, they've got an external enclosure, and you can put your own NVMe in, which is nice, unlike the 8K camera, the 8K Reds, which have their ex, you know proprietary cards. Yeah. And it plugs in via USB Type-C port. So you basically, you can just take it off and stick another one on as, as you need. Um, even in compressed format, it's 578 megabytes a second compressed which is two terabytes an hour. That's crazy. Yeah, he's gonna need a lot more storage. <laughs> uh, now you know why he built that three petabyte server. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be nuts. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to dust off my uh, automatic proxy generation automatic proxy tutor or uh, generation script. So our storage server when we were messing around with like um, Caden Live, it was uh, not working well for anything other than 1080p and uh we sort of set it up so that when we copy footage from the memory cards on the camera which are 4k uh it would just auto transcode and generate 1080p proxies and so 
when you go to edit it, you can just import the proxies and do all the editing with the proxies. And when you render, it'll use the 4K footage and just take however how long it takes. But that dramatically improved the um, the editing experience. I don't think Linus really likes the idea of proxies because if like you do proxies within Premiere, it is like a teeth gnashing horrible experience. But it, if I, it's it's probably it's not as horrible of an experience if you do it at media ingest time and there's a thing that just does it for you and it runs sufficiently fast. So there's a lot of there's a lot of oh and if, but I think that those are not insurmountable problems. He does have a, a an intermediate ingest proxy server now. Oh, that's good. He's got he's got a twenty eight core Xeon that it's basically all it does is proxy ingest, and he's got uh, a station with all the memory card readers. And what happens is when his, his technicians go over and they stick the card in, it ingests there, and it starts transcoding to the various formats, and it also at the same time makes a separate copy on a separate server in case everything Something goes crazy. Happens. That's a good strategy. That's a good way to handle it. I mean, he has spent more money on media management. I mean, I thought I was bad with what I was spending, and I'm just sitting there looking at it going, maybe I should just go back to 1080p. It would cost less and be so much easier. <laughs> It'll be I interesting to see how many viewers watching this right now leave a comment beneath this saying, yes, I watch all your videos at 4K, and if you were not at 4K, I'd be unhappy. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Not, not many of our people watch it at 4K either. We do capture at 4K. I've got the, the cameras that we have can do 400 megabit all I, which is nice, but it's a little bit of a struggle to edit that. Um, and so I've been thinking about going back to, right now we don't use proxies, but I've been thinking about going back to proxies or uh, doing, you know, just capturing in like a, you know, 422 something. Um, what do you use, GH5s? No, uh, well, we've got uh, GH5 B-roll cameras and then uh, Panasonic S1H. Um, for everything else, all the all the main camera stuff. So, I really like the. Uh, I really, I mean, they have a <laughs> the S one H has a built in fan, which is like, does it really need that? And then I'm seeing early reports about the Canon R five, where it's like it's overheating, and it's like, yes, good job, Panasonic, excellent. I'm looking at that now. Um, you have nicer cameras than I do. Yeah, that's that that should be illegal. <laughs> the S1H really it's it is it is an incredible output. I mean, it's a it's a it's a chunker of a camera, but the output from it is just unbelievable. It's a full frame camera. Yeah. As opposed to the micro uh, four thirds of the GH5. Yeah, yeah. Well, I GH5, kind of operate under the assumption that even that's overkill. I mean, we're doing YouTube. Yeah. Well, the GH5 is a is great because it's it's easy run and gun. And it's got great native lenses. It's you know there's a ton of, of of great micro four thirds lenses. There's not really a ton of great L mount lenses. Um, I do have the uh, I do have the uh, Canon adapter and some Canon lenses. And the, the Canon lenses basically work fine, like the Sigma, the old Sigma Canon lenses. But Sigma I think it pretty much has native L mount stuff now, which is not bad. But we still the GH5. It's easy to get the footage to match and. Uh, the S1H will give you unbelievable depth of field, just like you can have it like paper thin if you want. Hmm. But you know the GH5 does a does, does a, a, a pretty reasonable job if you um, if you do this, that, and the other. Uh, but that was one of the upgrades with the S1H was like the 400 megabit all all I codec, and we don't use it most of the time because it just generates huge files and is a pain to deal with. What are you filming that needs all that? Not really anything. Close up some motherboards. I want to be able to read the uh, the uh, numbers off of the VRM. It's like I can just you know just I can keep zooming in. It's like zoom in and enhance. It's like on those terrible uh, you know CSI crime scene shows. It's like there's we don't have the pixels. Oh no, I've got the pixels. Zoom and enhance <laughs> cliche. Yeah, yeah. I love how they zoom and enhance and then change the camera angle at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, they're like, oh, he's in the way. Uh, can, Move the camera around him. <laughs> yeah, let's, 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 let's content aware autofill that. It's just, oh no, that's not. That's so, not, that's are not we good. going to be seeing a level one text review of the Black Magic 12K camera anytime <laughs> soon? No, I think we're good with the, the S1H. The thing that drives me insane about the S1H is the autofocus isn't that great, and sometimes I will get that wrong. And so it's like, oh, we've got all this wonderful equipment, and it's just like, I'll try. 
the more I t- the more time I've spent with cameras, the more I realize that it's like uh, I'm not a big camera person. I never have been. I mean, I, I I respect them and I find them interesting from a technical point of view that they can do all of this. That internally they can handle all this data and compress data on the fly off of a battery and and the lenses can be either cheap or very expensive depending upon the quality of the glass and the and the features that you want. But I'm not a camera nut the way I'm a computer nut. And, and yeah. which is ironic because they're they're both computers basically nowadays. But sometimes when I'm looking at different cameras, I kind of get a taste of what some of the viewers feel. Sometimes because uh, people who don't follow technology all the time, they build a computer and then they kind of drift away from watching tech reviews for a while, and they <laughs> yeah. come back. Picture somebody who built like a Skylake. They, bu- they built an i7 6700K, and then they didn't watch anything until Zen 2 released. <laughs> and then we're like, well, do you get eight or 12 cores or the 16 core monster? And they're like, what know. happened to my four core? <laughs> it's now a sub $100 processor. It's, oh no. And they're, they're like, but but so I'll get a six core chip. And I'm like, I always tell people, I said, look, if you're the kind of person who bought an i7 in 2015, you are not the kind of person who should probably be buying a six core chip in 2020. Opinions may differ on that point, but it's sort of, it's like trading a used Lexus to buy a new Toyota. It may be new, <laughs> but you, I think I think the 3900X is probably the most important CPU release in the last five or ten years because the 3900X has the potential to be a five-year system. It's like the the four-core, like you know, with Haswell, the four-core, which I think the point that you're making is that you know you you buy that four-core computer and you're good for four or five years. The 3900X, you know, 32 or 64 gigs of memory, it's good for five years. You literally won't have to think about it for five years. Tell me if you agree or disagree on this point. One of the things I really love about the Ryzen 9 versus the Ryzen 7, um, especially as data sets get larger, games and textures get larger, is the Ryzen 7 has 36 megabytes of on-chip cache and this has 70. Yeah, it turns out that I don't think that gets enough play because when I'm running crap in the background, Windows is now you know sophisticated enough, and Linux has always been sophisticated enough, that um, it's really good about putting some of the load on one chiplet and some of the load on the other chiplet. And that you get that a little bit to a certain extent with the, uh, the eight cores because you get to the two four core and it's still got to go through the IO die. But it just seems like things get managed a lot better. I guess just the operating system gets its own CCX and then a game or something gets a CCX or two. And then, you know, some other background process gets another CCX because you're, you're working with four CCXs on that 12 core processor and four groups of 16, four groups, no, four groups of eight megs of cache um, for the L3 and, or no, it's six, yeah, yeah, that's right, 16, I can't, oh. I'm, it's multiple groups that, that can be managed independently. Yes, and you don't have that with, with, uh, with uh, anything that Intel currently has. And it, the Intel cache algorithm is so much more sophisticated and so it's a much smaller cache on Intel CPUs and it does amazingly well considering how small the cache is. But AMD wins in brute force, and that's just scary. Well, yes. Uh, I would kind of mentally, here's how I think of it, is picture having all your hard drives in a single, large, just a bunch of disks array, or a write array, take your pick. And if you're just doing one thing at a time and you're just reading and writing one thing at a time, it doesn't matter. But if you had two separate programs that needed to read and write at the same time, having two separate drive arrays, especially if they each have their own bus or they're connected separately, you can read from one and write from the other and they're not affecting each other. They each have their own bandwidth and they're not interrupting their seeks. They have their own cache, they have their own access. Um, The larger cache on the Ryzen 9 seems to be Glorious. So multitasking. <laughs> Why would you want to? Mo- I, I look at the Ryzen seven and I look at the Ryzen nine and I'm like, I don't actually think the Ryzen nine really costs much more, because if you get five years out of a Ryzen nine and you only get three years out of a Ryzen seven, how much have you saved? 
Yeah. Yeah, the only argument there is maybe you could get a Ryzen 9 or another future CPU for even less. Like, is there going to be a $300 Ryzen 9 4th gen? Probably not. I think that I think that AMD is probably going to price the next, like the 4000 series CPUs, quite a bit higher and clear out their 3000 series CPUs. And so it's like there'll be Ryzen 3000 CPUs well into 2021 and, uh, you know, maybe even into 2022. And those 4000 CPUs are going to be that much more expensive, especially if they're that much better. So I would remind everybody that AMD was first to one gigahertz. They beat Intel. Their original Athlon hit one gigahertz before the Pentium. I think the Pentium 3 was at 933 when the... Yeah. But of course, they beat it by like, what, a couple weeks. I mean, it was so close as to not matter. But they, you know, hey, we beat it. I think but it was the, June and August. You remember better than I do. <laughs> that might not do, be right. That's probably wrong. Do you remember like the launch price of the one gigahertz Athlon? Oh, yeah, it was a lot. It was surprisingly high. Uh, it was like $800, wasn't it? Keep going. Nine, was it more than that, like 1100 It was uh, a little over $1,200. Good Lord, yeah. That's, yeah, that was, that was way out of my price range. But the point is, when AMD has had the best processor, there have been times they've charged for it. Of yeah. course, they also thought when the uh, FX9590 came out, this was originally supposed to be $800, and of course that didn't last. No. Oops. Well, I think uh, I think that is probably a good uh, stopping point. What about you? That sounds good. Uh, you want me to do the outro real quick? Uh, fire away. Uh, all I can say is, first of all, uh, to all of my viewers watching right now, make sure you subscribe to the Level 1 Text channel. Link in the video description below because Wendell's awesome. He talks about all kinds of cool stuff. And if you like me, you will like him. So go subscribe right now. Don't wait. Do it right this second. Thanks. Okay, there you go. You're too kind. That's that's really awesome. That's, that's fine. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for having me for a chat or thanks for coming on and having a chat depending on what your perspective is it's been a fun chat the the unedited time is two hours maybe that's something maybe that's a patreon special i don't know but you know i, I, I i've had a good time i've had a i've had a good chat hopefully you've had a good chat um be sure to check out the tech deals channel there's a link below and get all the all the info and all the stuff because uh who would I mean now is really the time to buy a new computer I don't care if you bought a computer two years ago all this stuff and all the prices and it's like you know there's so much new stuff that it has really devalued a used computer I can remember like three years ago where it was like I'm gonna get a used server and turn it into a workstation it's gonna be amazing and now it's like you know there's a lot less I mean I'm not gonna say there's no value in that because there is still some some good deals to be had but this hardware is awesome and you you've you're you're always on top of the deal like the 64 gigs of memory for like 200 bucks i think that i uh, i think that i saw that first on twitter or something that you did and it was like 64 gigs is 200 dollars ah we've, we've bottomed out it costs more than that to get it here this is crazy why is this even a thing so it's fun i'm wendell this is level one i'm signing out i'll see you later